Hello, everyone. Nice to see everyone here today. Uh, we have a very nice turnout. Uh, I'm going to talk about Redux verticals, and, and I apologize for the slides. It's not going to be too visually interesting, but it's going to be mostly me talking about my experiences with Redux and working on a very large app. Um, and first, I just want to talk about who I am. Uh, my name is uh, Berkeley. I'm Berkeley True, pretty much everyone on, on the internet. Uh, and I've worked for Free Code Camp now for about three years. It's one of the first employees, actually, I think number two, technically. Um, thanks for the woo. <laughs> uh, I like to talk about the things I'm really, really excited about in, in the de developer world. And, and uh, the things that they boil down to are essentially these, these four things. Uh, declarative programming, uh, composability, reactivity, and simplicity. And I think these are. Uh, things that are kind of making a renaissance now, uh, but we don't see enough of them. And there's a lot of confusion around these simple ideas. Uh, and so um, I apply these principles and ideas to uh, how I write code every day. <clears throat> and so what I'm going to talk about are just general architectural guidelines when you're building Redux apps. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of frustrations when I talk to new developers about Redux and, and the things they're having issues with. And uh, uh, from my experiences and, and my readings, I, I feel like there's a lot of misconceptions. And, and it has to do with a couple of things. And a big one that a lot of people complain about with Redux is the boilerplate. And I seem, it seems to be like every other week, we see a new uh, Redux library, a library that wraps Redux so it makes it easier for you to do things in Redux. And, and I see them do the same, or create the same mistakes trying to solve uh, something that probably isn't a, boy, uh, a problem, boilerplate. Uh, the other thing is action creators. There's a lot of confusion around action creators, why they're needed, uh, why do we need to create them. Uh, and then when we, when we talk about reducers, we, we always see these long switch statements in reducers when we, when we look at tutorials and when we introduce people to Redux, uh, which I think is, is, gives the reducer kind of this, uh, this really bad look. And I dislike, because you, you don't actually write switch statements with reducers. In fact, you should probably write functions that compose to, to one single function. Uh, and then the, the last thing that's, uh, that is kind of a frustration is wiring things to React. So if you're using Redux with React, uh, you're probably using uh, React Redux and you're using the connect function. And then the connect function does a lot of things internally that makes it seem really complex or makes Redux seem really complex. But in actuality, what it's doing is it's caching stuff for you, uh, which is why it's really complex because it's caching is really hard. Um, the other, uh, the other thing I want to talk about is, is common misconceptions when it comes to actually writing Redux code. Uh, and the biggest one for me, and the one that annoys me the most every time I see it, is this one-to-one -one action reducer thing. Is you write an action, and then you write a reducer or a switch statement for that action, and then you put that action somewhere in your app. Uh, so if we use like the, the standard to do MVC app, you write an action to create a to-do, and then you write a switch statement or a reducer that adds a to-do to a list of to-dos. Uh, and then somewhere in your app, you put this action, right? Uh, to me, that's completely reversed of how should, things should be. Um, and then the other thing is creating actions as commands. So uh, I remember the big thing with Redux when it came out was getting away from this uh, MVC model, right? So React Redux, MVC was like a, a bad word. Uh, and the M in MVC is model, right? So model.get, model.set. These things were problems because in large, large apps, it became hard to distinguish where that dot .set and dot .get was happening, right? Where are these events happening that trigger these state changes? And we wanted to get away from that. But then when people started writing actions, they would just say, create to do, delete to do, update to do. That's not what we want in Redux. We want to get away from that command structure. <clears throat> boilerplate. Why I really like boilerplate? Because you kind of know where things are happening and see how things are happening. And uh, you can kind of skim through the boilerplate pretty quickly. You can use libraries, uh, small utility libraries, to get around the boilerplate. 
You can use snippets for the boilerplates. There are easy ways to, to write boilerplate without having to write boilerplate. Um, and the reason why Redux has so much boilerplate is because Redux is a very simple library. It's actually the code base for Redux itself is, uh, is really simple, it's really enjoyable to read, and I recommend everyone who's using Redux uh, to at least read it every couple months. Um, well, with libraries, you can mitigate all the problems with boilerplate, um, and that keeps Redux small and unopinionated. Now, now we get into the meat and potatoes of this. When you're building large Redux apps, you kind of need to decide on a couple things uh, as you start. Uh, you need to decide on some standards to help mitigate problems down the road with your apps. And unfortunately, I haven't seen many uh, JavaScript, JavaScript specific ways to implement these as part of the language. Um, and I'm taking a lot of these from other programming languages, specifically Clojure. Clojure has a really good way of managing uh, the file structure and uh, the way things are organized. Uh, and I've essentially applied those principles to my Redux apps. Um, and these are a couple of the standards that I uh, enforce in, in our code base. Uh, so actions are flux standard actions. So if you don't know what flux is, it's kind of what Redux originally came out of. Uh, and flux standard actions is essentially just saying an action should have a specific shape and it should stick to that specific shape. Uh, another thing is action types should be events. So this is, goes back to the command structure. Uh, an event in your app is something like a click, a hover, um, something that the user does or something that happens as a part of a fetch or a fetch request, a fetch request completed. Those are events in your app. Those are the things that should trigger state changes. Uh, and we should, be, we should treat those things as first class uh, and not uh, disregard them for commands. Uh, use namespacing when it comes to actions. So um, we can kind of keep the actual event name simple and then namespace those things to different parts of our app. Uh, use selectors. So selectors are really important because they can keep your state organized into a single place and then your, the rest of the app can interact with that state without having to worry about its shape. Uh, and then we, we get to the flux standard action, we can talk about the meta, com meta for commands. So sometimes it's unavoidable to use commands. Um, but we can keep actions as, action types as events and still use commands, and I'll show you how. And then the last thing I want to talk about very briefly, uh, epic saga and, sagas and thunks, thunks for business logic uh, and uh, side effects, which is very important. So flux standard action, very simple. Uh, there are three properties of an, a flux or a redux action. The type, which is the only one that is required, um, and that is something that describes an action that happens in your app. Uh, the payload, which is any data that is needed to change state in your redux app that that specific action targets. And then there's the meta. So the meta is something where you can put kind of anything you want. And what I found is, Using the meta for commands is the best way to use meta, uh, with very few exceptions. So action types as events, and I covered this very briefly, but the, the importance of this is the transparency of your app. So I assume everyone here who's used Redux has probably used the Redux dev tools. And the beauty of Redux dev tools is you can see exactly what the app is doing and what it did in the past. Um, so with action types, right, the Redux Dev Tools gives you a list of all the actions that have passed through it. Uh, with Redux type or action types as events, uh, you get to see every single uh, event that has happened in your app. But if you use action types as commands, uh, for instance, create to do, delete to do, uh, and let's say there's several ways for a user to delete or create a to do, then you don't know exactly where that action is coming from. You just know the, the property of the state changes. Uh, or how the state changes because of that action. But the thing is, that information is already part of Redux, right? And the Redux dev tools, it shows you a diff of how the state changes. So if your action type describes how your state changes, then you're losing information. So instead, action type should be events. So you can see where the source is coming from. I have some examples here. If we use the to-do MVC, you can kind of think of it as click on create to-do, hover over to-do, fetch to-do complete, 
Uh, so create over on, uh, click on create to do would be a link that says create to do for the user. Right? So the user clicks on create to do. Uh, hover over to do is the user hovers over to do and that would trigger some sort of CSS state change. Uh, another guideline is separation by feature and not by type. So if you've ever looked at a Redux tutorial, you'll see this very common file structure. Actions, reducers, uh, action types, right? You, you're, you see this separation uh, by the type of Redux uh, architecture. But when you have a large app, that gets really cumbersome because now you have uh, hundreds of files in your action types, hundreds of files in your reducers uh, folder, uh, hundreds of selectors, right? And they're all separated. You have to do, you have to grep your entire code base to figure out where these things are. Uh, so what I advocate for is separation by feature. And this has kind of happened when React first came out. Uh, React advocated, advocated separation by feature, not by type. So when people were writing Angular code, you put your templates in one place, you put your um, models in another, you put your controllers in another place. Um, React was like, hey, let's just put everything in one file. Template, um, model, code, and just get rid of the stuff that we don't need. So we just create one component, right? So this is taking that to the next step and moving everything that's a feature in your app, uh, which, for example, would be the nav bar, right? A nav bar is a feature of your app. So let's just have a folder that says nav bar. And everything that's Redux specific about the nav bar is in nav bar slash Redux. And then the components are in that folder, so nav bar slash uh, navbar.jsx is the main in, uh, the main component of that library of that fo uh, feature. So we keep everything related to that feature in one folder. It makes it super easy to change something about your app. You look at your app, you see what part of the your what feature that would fall into, and you look at your folder structure and you target that folder specifically. Common folder, less searching. Uh, another guideline, so there's this thing called Redux Ducks, and it's a pattern of keeping everything related to your Redux app in one single folder. So you declare your types up, uh, up at the top, uh, your action creators below that, your state and your reducers below that. So I use something very similar, except I've refactored out, um, I factor out my Redux epics, which we'll talk about at the end, into a separate file, because those can get uh, quite large. Um, but everything that has to do with your state is one file, and that makes it really easy to change things like your action, uh, your action types, uh, and then see how those types relate to state changes. Um, and then whenever you need to refactor something, it's all there in one place for you to change. And this is a quick image here. Let's see if I can scroll. Fortunately, it's a little small on this uh, screen. Uh, the slides are up online, and I'll post where they are later. Um, but the, the main idea here is you keep your types at the top of the file, uh, you keep your actions right below that, your, I'm sorry, your action creators, um, your default state right below that, uh, your selectors under, under that default state, and your reducers right below that. Uh, you keep your selectors, your state, your reducers right next to each other, your action types, action creators uh, right next to each other, and everything's in one place to find. Uh, and then your epics are imported into this file and exported to this file. And here's an example of a file structure here. This is actually from the uh, Free Code Camp code base. Um, and this gives you kind of an idea of what, the, what something uh, separation by feature would look like. So we have apps. Uh, the app is the main app for the, for the whole site. And then we have uh, Flash, right? This is a Flash uh, message for the user. Nav, we have a map, which is a specific thing to Free Code Camp. Uh, we have uh, a panes component, which produces panes for us. Uh, we have a router, and then we have a capital R router. We have routes, uh, toasts. These all separate those specific features of the app, the specific concerns. And if you need to change anything about the app, they're in there. And then this kind of peeks into that one feature folder. So here we have the map feature. And the map feature is just uh, essentially a tree of all the challenges at, on free code camp. Um, in that map folder, we have our Redux file, and then we have the index.js file. So another important guideline is to, enf to enforce and throughout the app is whenever you need to reach into a feature from another feature, there are two main entry points to that. The, the feature folder name slash index.js, so everything gets exported through that file. 
and anything to do with Redux is imported through uh, the feature slash Redux. Uh, and that way, you can move around, you can move things within the feature around without having to refactor the whole code base. Because if you're reaching into those specific components, um, then whenever you refactor a specific feature, you have to go and find everything else and refactor those things that are concerned with that. And then one last thing here, we have sort of this uh, lowercase routes folder. And uh, this is sort of a sub-feature, right? So everything that has its own specific route falls in here. And then we have the admin challenges map settings uh, features. And these are routes on free code cap, uh, except admin, that never got added. But uh, each one of these is its own feature. Uh, it has its own components and its own Redux uh, its own Redux files. And then we have a Redux.js, so routes slash Redux.js. We use a uh, Redux first router. So everything, that, everything about managing the state of the route is in that one folder. So namespacing uh, is a way to make use of the action name or the action type uh, string. Uh, if we namespace those action type strings, we can use um, less specific actual events. So a common event in an app is clicking on something, click on this, click on that. Uh, if you namespace your app by feature, uh, then you can use common events. So uh, map.clickonlink, to-do.clickonlink, to-do list.clickonlink. So you can have common names and then use the namespace to kind of pinpoint which part of, the uh, which part of your app that action is coming from. And here I have more examples. Header dot title update, footer dot click on show completed, to do list click on complete. Uh, these are all actual. Uh, some of these are actual examples from Free Code Camp. Again, these just to reiterate, reiterate here. These make it really easy to trace where your actions are coming from in your app, uh, and let you use common event names as well. So fetch something, fetch this, and not have to worry about name collisions uh, when it comes to action types. Um, and this is something I've uh, tried and, and haven't been able to get working just right yet, but if you separate by feature, uh, you're able to test these little components of your app in isolation, uh, mounting, their, mounting those little features on their own. So selectors, I'm gonna start picking up pace here. Uh, so selectors, uh, there's still a lot of misconceptions with, with selectors, but the main important thing is keeping your selectors right next to the state that they're, in, that they're responsible for. Uh, and then anywhere in your app that you need to pull in those selectors, uh, or anywhere in your app that needs to derive state from that part of your app, you do that specifically through the selectors. And this is also inspired by uh, a closure framework uh, called Untangled. Uh, Mainly, you, you, you say, you can think of the selector as an ID specifying where the data you want to pull out is, uh, instead of specifying the actual path to that data. Uh, and that makes refactoring much easier because uh, you keep the state and your selectors in the same spot. You change the selector, you can change the state at the same time, usually using the same command or, or uh, function in your editor or IDE. And then in your components, you pull all the selectors you need, and those selectors pull the state from different parts of your app. Um, and then in those components themselves is where you'd use things like reselect. So reselect is really neat. Um, you can think of a selector composer that adds uh, a very simple sort of caching. Um, and I found that uh, reselect works really well when you use it at the component level. So pulling in the state from different parts of your app, uh, that's where I would generally use uh, Reselect, and generally only if uh, there is some sort of complex um, ca calculations happening. So for, in, for an example, uh, usually you want to keep your state in your Redux uh, app uh, normalized. And so when you need to pull that state out onto your component, uh, you want to denormalize that state. So that usually, that usually means iterating through an array and pulling state out of a, a hash map. Uh, and then uh, mapping that into the, and molding that into the state you want to view, to display in your component. So this is where I would use reselect. Uh, meta for command. So if we think back to Flux standard actions, we have our type, our payload, and we have our meta. Uh, 
so meta is where I like to put in kind of this command, uh, this command structure. So sometimes it's kind of unavoidable uh, to have a state change according to a command. Uh, and this usually happens when you need to, when one part of the app, one uh, isolated feature needs to change state in another part of an app. Uh, and uh, what I see happen a lot is in most apps is you'll just reach into the other feature and pull in the action uh, type uh, and then dispatch that type in your component. And the problem with that is now you have this action type being dispatched in two different parts of your app. And so that you end up losing the transparency of where this action type is being dispatched from. So instead, in your uh, feature that needs that, whenever, whenever another feature needs to reach into that uh, specific feature, we add these utilities to create meta namespace meta properties. Uh, and that's where you would use a command. So for instance, um, action.meta.todoList.delete which would be uh, a command that the to-do list would listen to coming from other parts of the app and change its state internally. So now you still keep the action type, which could be action.footer.click on something. Uh, uh, you'd still preserve that transparency of where that action type is being dispatched from, uh, but then change state in an, another isolated part of your app. And since the, you, the function that's being pulled in uh, to the footer is coming from the to-do list. The to-do to list completely controls how that function state uh, changes state uh, and, and the name of that uh, meta property. And usually you want to avoid this, this kind of command structure, but it, like I said, sometimes it's unavoidable. Uh, and then the last thing I want to talk about are epics, sagas, and thunks. Uh, so, uh, I don't know how many of you here are familiar with epics, uh, but epics are essentially functions that take a stream of actions from your Redux app and return a stream of actions. And uh, sagas work similarly. I think most people who've used Redux here are familiar with thunks. Um, the, the role that epics should play in your app is to represent uh, application state change, right? So you keep your your UI state uh, changes happening in your reducer, but when you have business logic that needs that has to have some complex logic or pull in state from multiple places in your app, you want to do that in Epic. When you have an action that triggers a data request from your server, uh, you want to do that in your Epic. Um, and when you want to drive data from multiple places and then trigger some sort of state change when something happens, some uh, specific part of your app happens. Um, that's when you would use an epic uh, to dispatch another action. Uh, but that last one is actually sort of an anti-pattern. I've noticed it being used um, when you separate things by feature. Sometimes you want uh, one state in another part of your app to change state uh, in another app. Uh, and you can't really do that with a command structure, so some, some developers will use an epic. And the problem with that is you end up having this pattern of event triggering other uh, events. But uh, what you do, what, what you want to avoid is, what you want to do is dispatch one action only and then have the epic uh, transform state for you. And the last thing I want to say is th these ideas kind of came from mostly the closure world. Um, uh, closure namespacing is really interesting uh, way of writing a language. Uh, and uh, another thing I want to talk about or just mention briefly is uh, Fulcro, which is a closure script, closure framework. Um, it has a really interesting way of uh, dividing up your components, uh, your React components. And yes, it's a React app that's just written in closure. Uh, it has a really interesting way of, of dividing up how uh, components, their data, and their actions or mutations in closure script are written and organized. And, uh, that's it. Thanks for listening.